Hello friends. Welcome to this uh, special edition of GEMS video. This time it is a professional edition. And this is focused towards modern medical students and physicians. And this lecture is on pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. The new and the newer developments. So if you look at the homeostasis of glucose in healthy individuals a normal glucose homeostasis in the basal or in the postprandial state is maintained and this is maintained despite huge and wide fluctuations in the supply and demand and this is by means of a regulated and dynamic interaction between tissue sensitivity of insulin and insulin secretion. Look at the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. In the past, it was very simple. It was the duo of pancreatic beta cell failure with a defective insulin secretion in the background of an insulin resistance. And over the years, with the new research, the triumvirate in, uh, got evolved and with the addition of hepatic gluconeogenesis and then the dirty dozen, the treacherous or the unlucky 13, the 13 different aspects and causes for the causation of type 2 diabetes. Quite interesting. And this is uh, ADA in 2009 in New Orleans, Sweet Memories, and it was exactly in this ATA, in 2009, DeFranco made this banding lecture where he presented the evidence of ominous octet, the eight different reasons for type 2 diabetes. And this is a hot topic even now being discussed and presented at various conventions and conferences. This is a natural progression of type 2 diabetes. On the left end of the spectrum, you have normal glucose tolerance and then you have the diagnosis of diabetes and then overt diabetes. When you observe the beta cell function, the beta cell failure progresses and as you can see over here, the insulin secretion becomes inadequate. It goes up and then gradually it comes down. And this happens, insulin secretion becomes inadequate to avert the rising levels in the glucose levels. And beta cell function plays a major role in the development of type 2 diabetes across the spectrum of hyperglycemia from pre-diabetes to overt diabetes. So these cells are in a constant state of dynamism. And the postprandials, as you can see here, will go up first and then followed by the postprandial, the fasting glucose gradually rises. And that's type two diabetes. And that is the evolution of type two diabetes. As long as the beta cells are capable of augmenting the secretion of insulin sufficiently enough to overcome the insulin resistance, the glucose tolerance remains normal. It remains normal. And when the beta cell responds to an increment in the glucose level, that is delta G, with an increment in the insulin levels and that is delta i the delta i by delta g ratio it was considered once as the measure of the beta cell function the beta cell also takes into account the severity of ir and accordingly will adjust the secretion of insulin the gold standard to measure the beta cell function is the glucose disposition index as indicated here. We are all practicing clinicians and let me move on to something 
which is relevant in practice. This is normal glucose tolerance and then you have impaired glucose tolerance and on the right you have diagnosed diabetes. Intuitive is in the upper tertile of the normal glucose tolerance and that is glucose values below 140 milligram percentage would have lost two thirds of their beta cell function. And in those individuals who are in the upper tertile of impaired glucose tolerance, that is the glucose is below 200 milligram percentage, they could have lost 80 to 85 percent of their beta cell function. Shocking, shocking. Even before type 2 diabetes is diagnosed, almost 80 to 85 percent of the beta cell function is lost and hence the significance of insulin supplementation sufficiently early in the course of diabetes. So let us look at the non-modifiable factors. Age and genes are two well-known non-modifiable factors which will influence the beta cell health. Transcription factors associate beta cell dysfunction. Example is the T allele of single nucleotide polymorphism of the TCF7L2 gene and that is a future. In future, uh, there will be genomics and there will be precision diabetology where you will choose the drug for your individual patients which will be more suitable for that patient. So with progression of the age, there is beta cell apoptosis, there is amyloid deposition in the islet cells. But what is constant in the diabetes evolution is insulin resistance in the background. It is a consistent finding in type 2 diabetes and it occurs, it appears even before the onset of type 2 diabetes. This is pregnancy. During the latter half of pregnancy, even in women with normal glucose homeostasis, there is insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance is derived from, it results from placental hormones, especially the human placental lactogen. A diagnosis of a gestational diabetes is made if the maternal beta cells are incapable of overcoming the insulin resistance induced by the placental hormones. Let me move on to hepatic insulin resistance. How much amount of glucose is produced by the liver per day? Normally, normally a liver produces 2 milligrams per kilogram per minute of glucose whereas in diabetes it is 2.5 milligrams per kilogram per minute. So there is an extra load, overload of 25 to 30 grams of glucose into the systemic circulation. And this increased hepatic glucose production occurs even when the fasting plasma insulin levels are increased several folds, up to three fold, indicating severe insulin resistance to the suppressive effect on hepatic glucose production and that is insulin resistance in the liver. Let me now discuss the muscle insulin resistance. Never ever underestimate the strength of the skeletal muscle. Look at the functions of the skeletal muscle and the insulin resistance. In the muscle, Insulin resistance is manifested by the impaired glucose uptake after the carb ingestion resulting in postprandial elevations of the glucose. Skeletal muscle alone accounts to more than 75% the excess glucose intake uptake. In type 2 diabetes, the muscle insulin resistance accounts for more than 85 to 90 percent of the impairment of the glucose dispersal and hence exercise, physical activity will have a significant role in the prevention and in the treatment of type 2 diabetes and this is even when 
correcting for the confounding factors such as overweight. Even when somebody is overweight or obesity, physical activity will have a pivotal role in treating the insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle. And now it is a turn of the adipose tissue. In health and in type 2 diabetes, insulin has got different actions on the adipose tissue. In health, insulin has got an anti-lipolytic effect on the fat cells. Whereas in type 2 diabetes, insulin induces lipolysis and it results in day-long elevations of free fatty acids. Raised free fatty acids in turn stimulate gluconeogenesis, induce hepatic and muscle insulin resistance and impair the beta cell function. This is a symbolic representation of adipose tissue insulin resistance. Deranged adipocytes tend to secrete less than normal amounts of insulin sensitizing hormones. And these are the adipocytokines. The adiponectin is reduced in diabetes. This is the enlarged fat cell, a symbolic representation, which is insulin resistant, which has got a lesser capacity to store fat. And when the storage capacity of the adipocytes exceeds, the lipid overflows into the muscle, the lipid overflows into the liver, it overflows into the beta cell, there is a lipotoxicity of the beta cells onto the arterial vascular smooth muscles leading to muscle and hepatic insulin resistance and even accelerated atherosclerosis. And these are the results of adipose tissue insulin resistance and hence the recognition of different types of uh, adipose tissue, the white fat cell, the beige fat cell, the brown adipose tissue and the brown adipose tissue has raised the possibility for its involvement in the human energy homeostasis and in preventing type 2 diabetes and it lessens with age, it lessens with high body mass index and with higher glucose levels. Alpha cell and glucagon, it was as early as in the 1970s. Many groups have established that type 2 diabetes individuals have elevated levels of glucagon. And how does glucagon get elevated in type 2 diabetes? Beta cells are supposed to de-differentiate. And during this process of de-differentiation, some of these beta cells get get converted to the alpha cells secreting glucagon. So even when the insulin levels progressively decline in type 2 diabetes, the glucagon levels tend to be elevated. So this is uh, the postprandial uh, glucagon levels and here you can visualize the non-suppressed glucagon levels in type 2 diabetes in contrast to suppression in normal healthy individuals. The laws are the lessening or diminution of incretin effect, another pathophysiological defect in type 2 diabetes and hence the role of GLP-1 receptor agonists such as the liraglutide with CB benefits, the role of gliptins such as citagliptin. And this is the next defect in type 2 diabetes, the increased glucose reabsorption. And hence the role of glyphosins, the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors such as dapaglyphosin, canaglyphosin, etc. And another pathophysiological defect and this is the neurotransmitter dysfunction in the brain. Imagine that you are cutting the vagus nerve or you are ablating the hypothalamus. And both of these can lead to a beta cell dysregulation and subsequent abnormalities in the blood sugar regulation. And that's the role of the brain. Clock genes, the recognition of the new clock genes in every tissue, 
the new speciality of chrono medicine in the department of medicine as a branch of medicine and these are major determinants of circadian rhythmicity and now being investigated due to their perceived impact on metabolic syndrome look at this picture these are migratory birds and there is a reason for me to show this picture hyper dopaminergic or hyper adrenergic state this is initially it evolved as an adaptive mechanism for migratory birds and this is to meet their extra energy requirement because they may be flying for days and weeks together and this sustained hyperglycemia is an adaptive mechanism however a sustained hyper adrenergic state is a mad adaptation and this triggers hyperglycemia look at dopamine this is now recognized as the forgotten felon of diabetes is the most abundant catecholamine in the human brain in diabetes dopamine gets reduced in the early morning leading to elevated hepatic gluconeogenesis and lipolysis time to release bromocriptin that is quick release formulation administered within 2 hours of waking up in the morning augments the low hypothalamic dopamine levels and reduces the sympathetic tone and is one of the recommended therapies in indicated patients with type 2 diabetes stress plays a vital role a significant role by activation of the sympathetic nervous system with excessive catecholamine release contributing to stress induced hyperglycemia this is the answer to the question of many of our patients doctor does stress produce diabetes of course stress can produce diabetes and here the treatment should involve in addition to therapies for diabetes non pharmacological interventions such as cognitive behavioral therapy coping skills training and relaxation therapy the role of vitamin d vitamin d has a range of biological functions such as cell differentiation inhibition of cell growth and immunomodulation look at some of these evidences in children receiving vitamin d supplementation during the first year of life there is an 80% reduced risk of type 1 diabetes and it has been documented that in children with low vitamin d levels with type 1 diabetes they require higher doses of insulin in one of our own studies we have presented this at the american diabetes association we have found that by supplementing vitamin d in deficient individuals and by normalizing the vitamin d levels there is a trend towards lower a1c and this has got a high clinical relevance the ras the renin angiotensin system the detrimental effects that the ras has on insulin secretion is mediated by a reduction in the pancreatic blood flow inducing islet cell fibrosis and oxidative stress and inflammation hence the role of ras blockade which will improve the blood flow and the microcirculation in the skeletal muscles it reduces the adipocyte size and it protects the pancreatic beta cells testosterone has a dual function men versus in women the effect of testosterone on insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes if the level is low in males and if the level is high in females it triggers and favors insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and this has been proven in hypogonadism it has proven in pcod in females testosterone substitution improved insulin sensitivity in men with newly diagnosed diabetes addition of testosterone in some of the studies to a regimen of lifestyles significantly improved the outcomes of glycemic control this is hippocrates this is hippocrates and this is one of his statements 
all disease begins in the gut gut microbiota another major evolving branch of medicine gut dysbiosis intestinal barrier dysfunction and the subsequent endotoxemia are all related to inflammation insulin resistance and finally the cv events in diabetes this is of type 2 diabetes patients were found to have relatively high or enriched with endotoxin producing gram negative bacteria phyla bacteria ducts and proteobacteria and individuals even before the onset of diabetes have moderate degree of gut microbial dysbiosis and reduction the butyrate producing bacteria and when you infuse intestinal microbiota from lean normal subjects there is an improvement in the insulin sensitivity which is noticed in metabolic syndrome patients what is the result of blood transfusions will it have any impact on diabetes will it prevent diabetes or will it promote diabetes this is the answer blood donations are beneficial in preventing diabetes the more number of blood donations lesser the incidences of diabetes and it has been proven in those subjects with hereditary hemochromatosis insulin deficiency and insulin resistance contribute to the pathophysiology in hereditary hemochromatosis so here i am going to conclude the treacherous 13 or the unlucky 13 so we have been preparing a paper on this as advised by dr sanjay kalra on the different pathophysiological defects being now recognized in type 2 diabetes etiopathogenesis and these are those 13 different reasons and you have so many therapies currently available to focus to address each one of them with the recognition of multiple factors it is quite obvious that a single agent is inappropriate to treat diabetes in type 2 diabetes you need a combination of medications and the selection of these medications need to be made based on the recognition of the pathophysiological defects in individual patients the disease is complex and you need to combine pharmacotherapy with non pharmacological methods i sincerely believe that this presentation has been useful to you thank you for viewing and bye bye from jodhdev's diabetes research centers from kerala thank you